I want to welcome everybody to this episode, what we call Seeding the Future in collaboration with the Socrates program at McMaster and, and the McMaster Children and Youth University. A lot of this material will be posted to our website at mcyu.ca. So if you want to revisit some of the material, you're more than welcome to go in and do that. I wanted to introduce at this time, uh, Stefan Weber. He's a conservational biologist with Carolina Canada, and he uh, specializes in studying rare plants. Uh, Stefan has worked in uh, habitat restoration for nearly a decade and is currently completing his PhD at McMaster University. Uh, and he has grown over 300 wild plants from seeds. That is quite amazing. He's an expert. Go ahead, Stefan. So let's get started. We live in a really cool part of the country. We are in the most southern point of Canada, um, which happens to also be the most biodiverse region. We have uh, the most species at risk or endangered species here. Um, and it's also the most densely populated. So that means that over 85% of the landscape in Southern Ontario is impacted directly by humans in some way. Uh, you know, through cities, through agriculture, through roads. Um, so that means that, you know, there's often conflict between wildlife and habitat and humans and the needs of humans um, to flourish. So a lot of people don't realize that Southern Ontario was actually covered in prairie, tall grass prairie and grasslands, um, you know, hundreds of years ago. And unfortunately, only about 3% of those grasslands and prairies remain. Um, so it's a, it's a really cool and unique part of the country that is full of fascinating uh, nature and ecosystems. So um, I mentioned a species at risk, and this is what we call plants and animals that are threatened uh, on the landscape by habitat loss, by poaching, by invasive species and pests and diseases. So this is one of our rarest trees in Canada. This is called a cucumber magnolia tree. And it is a large flowering magnolia, but it's called a cucumber magnolia because it creates these funny little pickle shaped pink fruits in the fall. And there are fewer than 200 of these trees left in the wild in, in Ontario. Um, but fortunately, um, I get to work with some really amazing biologists to collect the seed from these trees and grow lots of little cucumber magnolia babies. And we're now ready to start planting these babies um, in protected landscapes across the Carolinian region. So this is just some of the work that we're doing to help rare plants. Now, this is probably the most Carolinian This is a tulip tree, and it's not endangered. It's not a species at risk, but it is quite rare on the landscape, and um, we're working really hard to grow lots of them for people to plant more of. They make excellent urban trees, um, so if you're planting a park or a garden, you could definitely consider planting a tulip tree. They really have really large flowers that attract birds and bees, and uh, they grow really tall, really fast. So they're an excellent shade tree and um, are beautiful as well. So the Carolinian zone in Canada um, is comprised of a lot of different types of habitats from bogs and marshes to savannas and prairies and forests. And uh, one of the characteristics of a healthy landscape is plant communities that are biodiverse and are full of native wildflowers. So these are wildflowers that have evolved in Ontario and are adapted to the conditions in Ontario, including our winters and all the different animals that live here. However, there are a number of things that threaten healthy plant communities and healthy ecosystems in the Carolinian zone. And one of them 
is invasive species. So you may have seen this plant growing on the side of the road or near a pond along a trail. Um, this plant does not belong in North America. It is called Phragmites and it is an invasive plant. Now invasive just means that it is able to dominate a large area and push out all the other plants, the native plants that would otherwise grow there. And it also doesn't support very much wildlife, so it's not very good for biodiversity. And it's spreading rapidly and excludes a lot of the plants that belong on this landscape. So why do we care so much about uh, these plant communities and, and why do we want to prevent them from disappearing? Well, um, native plant communities really deliver a lot of value to us as human beings. They pollinate, uh, they provide pollination for our crops, um, they provide flood control, they provide erosion control, and they help with nutrient cycling, so returning carbon back to the soil. Um, but the diversity of species is important as well, because if you think of it, every plant, every animal has a different set of traits that it uses to cope and thrive in a very, very unpredictable and sometimes challenging world, right? So some plants need to survive freezing winters, they need to survive drought, they need to survive being eaten by deer and mice, and then they need to reproduce and make more of themselves and spread around the landscape. These things are challenging, and every single species on Earth brings its own set of tools and solutions to solving those problems of life. So the more different species you have, the more different solutions to problems you have. And because we don't know what's coming in the future, we don't know what's going to happen, and things are certainly uh, likely to change, we want to have as many different solutions on hand as possible. So that's why we want a lot of different species or a high amount of biodiversity. And biodiversity is so important that the United Nations declared that this decade is the official decade of biodiversity and governments all over the world have pledged time and resources to promoting the value of biodiversity and making sure everyone understands these ecosystem services come from. And what's really exciting is that in 2021, the United Nations will be launching the Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which encourages everybody, every government, every citizen to take part in actively creating and restoring healthy landscapes full of these native plants. So it's a really easy way to get involved in conservation. So what does biodiversity look like here in Ontario? Um, so we talked about species at risk. This little plant is also endangered. It is actually the rarest member of the most diverse flowering plant family that we have in Ontario. So it's a member of the legume family, which includes beans and peas and clovers. But this is a native legume. It's a wild plant. And this one actually only occurs in one place in Ontario. It's threatened by um, invasive insect pests and also invasive plants. But there are all kinds of other really interesting wild native legumes in Ontario. Uh, there's actually over 30 of them um, in southern Ontario alone. But each of these species are becoming increasingly rare on the landscape, and that's troubling because legumes are super important for plant communities. Legumes are able to create their own nitrogen, which is like fertilizer. So they can fertilize themselves and other plants can't. So a lot of other plants will grow better when they're growing around legumes. Unfortunately, in Ontario, we have nitrogen that's deposited through our rain because of air pollution. So there's a small amount of nitrogen that's being rained down all across the landscape in southern Ontario. So this means that plants don't need to, you know, find nitrogen 
the way that they used to, and it really takes away the advantage that these legumes have and prevents them from being ecosystem engineers. So they're increasingly rare on the landscape because of something like air pollution. So we're losing diversity um, of plants, which means we're losing diversity of insects as well. This is another member of the legume family. This is blue lupin, and it is the host plant for a rare butterfly called the Carner blue butterfly. It also attracts various bees, um, but this butterfly has not been seen in Ontario since the mid 1990s because the lupin population had dropped so low. So one of the projects I'm working on right now is trying to increase the number of lupin populations on the landscape in hopes to bring the Carner blue butterfly back, which I've personally never seen and nobody has seen in Ontario for decades. But this kind of relationship that the Carner blue butterfly has with the lupin is not uncommon at all. This is actually what supports most of the biodiversity that we see out in the world, all of the different types of insects and birds that we see, it's because they have specialized relationships with other plants and animals. So the example that you probably already know of is the monarch butterfly. So monarch butterflies can only lay their eggs on milkweed plants because the caterpillars, the young monarchs, can only eat the leaves of milkweed specialized relationship, which means without milkweed, you don't get monarch butterflies. Um, but to add complexity and diversity to that, the adults need to feed from a wide variety of different plants as they're migrating across the landscape, including asters and goldenrods and blazing stars. So all these different flowers support monarch butterflies and without this vast diversity, you wouldn't have these really, really cool bugs on the landscape. And it's not just monarchs. Our largest butterfly in Ontario, the giant swallowtail, which is almost as big as my hands, um, can only lay its eggs on two native shrubs, the prickly ash and the hop tree. Um, so without these shrubs, you wouldn't have giant swallowtails. And it's not just butterflies, there are, are all kinds of wild bees that have similar specialized relationships. So this is called a bergamot bee. It's tiny, about a centimeter long, and it can only feed its babies the pollen of wild bergamot. And without wild bergamot, you would not have this bee. And what's even more fascinating is that this little bee in its whole lifetime will only ever move about 200 meters. That's not very far. You can walk 200 meters in no time. So if there isn't a patch of wild bergamot every 200 meters, this species can't move around the landscape and it starts to disappear. So we really need a diversity of plants if we want to see a diversity of really cool insects as well. So just to remind you why we kind of care so much about pollinators like butterflies and bees, it's because they provide a very valuable service to us called pollination. So just to remind you, all flowering plants will create a flower and then they will attract pollinators by making that flower colorful or smell really nice. And then the pollinators will get covered in grains of pollen and carry that pollen to the next flower. Now you can think of a pollen grain as a tiny little spaceship and inside of a very hard protective coat, tiny, tiny, is all the genetic information from the parent plant. And so the pollinator brings that genetic information to a second plant, which has a second set of genetic information stored in its ovules. And together they will fuse and they'll create a baby plant. And that baby plant is wrapped up inside of a seed. 
and often that seed is then wrapped up in a fleshy fruit. So something sweet and edible um, that you and I might like to eat or maybe something like a nut that a squirrel would like to eat. And so the squirrel will collect this and help plant that seed. So that's why pollinators are so important. Without them, we wouldn't have all of these crops that we depend on and we love to eat. So we are focusing on growing wild plants to support pollinators when our crop plants are not flowering. So if our pollinators had to rely only on our crop plants, they would starve through the rest of the year because our crops only bloom for you know one or two weeks of the year. So it's important to have wild plants that are flowering all through the season from early spring all the way to late fall. And this is one of my favorite spring flowering native plants. This is called Virginia bluebells. And this is my friend Kristen standing in probably the largest wild population that's left in Ontario. And we've been managing it for about eight years now for seed production. So in removing invasive plants, opening up the canopy to allow more light in so that the plants can produce a lot more seeds for us to use. And with these seeds, we're able to grow a lot more Virginia bluebells and spread them around the Carolinian zone so that we can help provide early spring nectar to our pollinators while they're waiting for our crop plants to bloom. So we go and we collect all of our seed from wild populations because it's important that we're representing the plants that are actually um, native to Ontario. So plants that have actually evolved here in Ontario and are adapted to our growing conditions and to the animals like the pollinators that are part of the community. So here's another really interesting and rare Carolinian plant that we're collecting seed from. And because we can't just go to a typical garden center or nursery and buy these plants, we have to work um, with the plant growers from day one to treat the seeds and um, grow them in a way that will allow them to flourish. A lot of these plants we've never grown before um, or they're very hard to grow. Some of them are very interesting to work with. Um, so this is called soapberry, and it's a rare prairie shrub that can actually be used to remove dirt and oil. The flesh of the berries, the, the squishy part of the berries, will lather up really nicely and make a soap. You can wash your hands, you can wash your socks. So we call this a seed strategy. We call this a seed strategy because the seeds are really the foundation of everything. Without the seeds, you can't have the plants, and without the plants, you can't have the insects and the birds and everything else. So we focus on creating as many seeds as possible. We go to the wild where there might be just a small population and a small amount of seed, and we collect it. We bring it back to the lab, and we clean it, and we process it, and we get it ready to grow. And we make sure that every seed has the best chance it possibly can um, to germinate so that we get as many plants as possible. And then we can simply grow them out in rows like a crop of corn or pumpkins or any crop. And we can grow wildflower seeds as our crop. And so in that way, we can kind of farm biodiversity in a very direct way. Um, if we want to see more butterflies and bees on the landscape, we can create more of their wildflowers. So that's really exciting and fun. And in a couple of years, you can go from a tiny population of milkweed on the roadside to a half an acre of milkweed that's supporting butterflies and bees throughout the summer and then providing seed for biologists like me to do habitat restoration. So it's really cool and exciting work, and you don't have to have a really large farm to do this kind of restoration work. So um, anybody with a garden, um, with a backyard, with a community garden plot, anybody who's part of a horticultural society 
or a garden club, you can get involved in conservation. And so I've been working with an organization called Carolinian Canada on a program that we call In the Zone, which is the Carolinian Zone. So um, we have developed a tool for gardeners called our Garden Tracker. And this allows you to learn about native plant gardening, but also it lets you track your contribution to conservation as a gardener. So we will ask you questions about what kinds of habitat you've created. We, we will ask you about what kinds of native plants you're planting, and we'll ask you what kinds of wildlife have you seen? Birds or butterflies or frogs? Um, and there's also all kinds of great tips about how to reduce water use, how to create a nesting habitat for wild bees, um, and there's uh, fun videos that you can watch, and there's also um, a contest that you can enter to win a pair of pawpaw trees. So these are rare Carolinian trees that really large, delicious fruit. And uh, if you sign up for our garden tracker, um, you can enter the contest to win a pair of pawpaws for your own garden. So that's really exciting and really fun. I want a pawpaw. I have entered my garden. Um, it's also a really fun thing to do with your friends and your family. It's totally free. It's not an app. It's just a, a website that you log into and you can update your garden as often as you like. So every time you plant a tree or every time you add a flower, you can add those things to your garden tracker. So that's really cool. We also have a program that helps gardeners pick out their plants at the garden center because it's really important when you're choosing a plant to put in your garden that you're choosing something that's actually truly native to southwestern Ontario, to the Carolinian zone that you're living in. A lot of plants that we buy at our garden centers um, are cultivars, uh, which means they're not wild plants, and a lot of them originate in Europe, in Asia, um, from all around the world. But it's important that you choose plants that originate in southwestern Ontario because they will actually be able to support the wildlife, the bees and the butterflies that live in southwestern Ontario. So we've made this a bit easy because it can be tricky for people to know what is native and what's not. We've teamed up with our friends at the World Wildlife Fund, and we've teamed up with over a dozen different native plant growers in Ontario um, for this tag program that will tag truly native plants in the garden center. So all of these plants have been grown from seed that was collected from plants that originate in the wild. So uh, like the bluebells that me and Kristen have been managing, all of the plants um, are grown from original wild populations in Ontario. So some plants that are labeled as native plants in the garden center will actually come from the United States, they'll come from Oregon, they'll come from sometimes even Manitoba. Um, so these plants might be native to Canada or they might be native to North America more broadly, but they're not actually native to our zone here in Southern Ontario. So when you're out shopping for native plants, look for the little panda. Um, and here's uh, just a map of all of the gardens that we have included um, participating within the zone. So nearly 5,000 gardens that are registered right now, and um, we're, we're hoping to reach 10,000 by the end of the year. So before we, um, I guess, break for some questions and discussion, I just want to tell you about another really fun um, way to get engaged with native plants and wildlife in your community. So this is a phone based app. So certainly um, you'll you'll probably want you know permission from your parents or to do this along with your family, but it's a great way to identify the 
plants and animals that are in your garden or in your community nearby. So what you do is you can take pictures of anything that you see and you can upload those observations to the iNaturalist app and help get an identification for that organism. So there are all kinds of people who will see your observation and will confirm your identification, whether it's a monarch butterfly or perhaps the butterfly that mimics a monarch butterfly, which is a viceroy. So if you need to tell the difference between a monarch and a viceroy, you could upload that picture to iNaturalist and get a confirmation. You're also then logging the observation of that uh, insect, which contributes to citizen science. It helps biologists understand where these animals are on the landscape and understand how many um, there are. So this is often very difficult and time consuming work for a biologist to organize across a large region like the Carolinian zone, but if you have everyone involved, everyone who loves nature using iNaturalist logging their observations, then everyone becomes a wildlife biologist. It's a really, really powerful tool. So some of the things that you might want to go outside and log into iNaturalist might be the plants that are in your garden. It might be some of the insects that you see visiting the flowers around um, your house or your school. Um, maybe you'd like to collect milkweed seeds, but you're not quite sure if you have found a milkweed or not. Well, you can take a picture of the seeds in the seed pod and you can have somebody on iNaturalist confirm that for you. So there's all kinds of really fun things. It's not limited to just plants and insects. You can log observations about raccoons or any birds or even people if you want to. Um, so, so take a look at iNaturalist. Uh, make sure that you're exploring places that you have permission to explore um, and make sure that you're only taking photos. So I do want to encourage you to get engaged with nature, but don't handle nature, okay? So if you see a caterpillar, just leave it alone. You don't need to pick it up. Um, you know, frogs, toads, take a picture, say hi, and log it on to iNaturalist. And that way your observation will live on and your little your little critter friend will have contributed um, to science. So I don't know if anyone has ever played Pokemon Go, but this uh, iNaturalist app is basically Pokemon Go, but with real life Pokemon. They're called insects and, and plants and birds. Um, so it's actually really fun. You can even compete with your friends and see how many different uh, bugs you can identify in one day, for example. So um, I'm sure you have lots of questions and I'd love to chat more with you guys about these things. So I'm gonna um, pause my slides here and open, open things up for questions and discussion. Does anybody have any questions for Stefan? Please raise your hand and then I'll be able to call on you. Uh, go ahead. When you want to take a picture of like um, it, um, insects, is it just like anyone? Yeah, you can you can choose the first insect you see. And if you don't know what it is, you could take a picture of it and they could help you identify it. Some people um, they go out on a mission. They say, I want to only identify butterflies today because I've been seeing a lot of different butterflies. So you can go out and choose which things you want to take pictures of. It's totally up to you. Uh, Miss uh, McGillis's class. Hi there. Uh, we had a question about the cucumber tree. Uh, one of my students was asking if you, it's safe to eat the fruit or a vegetable that is grown on that tree. No, not that tree. So it it's called a cucumber magnolia because it looks like a cucumber from the outside, 
while it's developing. Before it turns pink, it's sort of long and warty and um, green, but then it turns pink in the fall. But you don't want to eat those. Um, they're meant for birds to eat, and that's why they're so colorful, to attract birds. Do you want to go ahead? My question is, uh, do we have to do like uh, only insects or can we do uh, plants? Uh, so oh. Insects, plants, spiders, moths, birds, anything that's alive. I see so many insects in that plane. Yeah, you could even log, you know, ants, anything centipedes, else? anything you want. Oh, I have a centipede in the basement. Do you have another question? Yeah, so like um, when you create an account, um, like the website you guys were talking about, so when you create an account, when you take a picture, it like shows on your account? Yes, so it will save all of your observations um, in your account. So you kind of have like a journal log of, of all the different things that you've seen and it'll record the picture you took and you know when you took the picture and you can even insert little notes there to help you maybe remember it. Um, but yeah, it, it keeps a log and then it also puts um, sort of a, a GPS point on a map for everyone else to see. So if someone is looking for a chestnut tree and you've seen one, they'll be able to see where you saw a chestnut tree. Do you have another question? Does someone in your class have another question? I do have a question. Um, when my husband is a big gardener and he likes to, uh, he'd be very interested in this lecture. Where can, you mentioned that um, plants that are uh, kind of native to this area are, are um, are identified somehow. Is that in every uh, gardening center you go to, or are there specific ones I should direct him to? Sure, yes. Um, so there is a list of participating retailers on the Carolinian Canada In the Zone website. I believe there's about 15, and they're across the zone from Windsor to Toronto. Um, there are a few in the Hamilton region for sure. Um, one of them I could mention is Ontario native plants. Um, and then the other one I could mention is the Kayanisei native plant nursery. And so those are about each of them 10 minutes out of town, but they both supply um, source identified truly native plants and um, they're all certified through our in the zone program. And we will be putting some of the links associated with this lecture on also the mcyu.ca website for everybody to get access to. I have a question about the plants. Is there certain plants that you don't want to have together due to the insects or animals that feed off it or live there? Not that I can think of. Um, so each each plant will attract a different type of insect or or bird or critter so uh, wildflowers will obviously attract pollinators and a lot of shrubs that produce fruits will primarily attract birds um, sometimes people have problems with like a nut producing tree because they get a lot of squirrels and that can be sometimes a nuisance in some areas um, but um, I can't I can't think of any kind of problems that you'd be creating by planting some wild plants. Sorry, I just have another question over here. How does that one rare butterfly that hasn't been seen since the 1990s look like? It is small and sort of a silvery blue color. Um, I would say it's, it's only about that big. Um, if you I don't have a photo of it because I've never seen it, but if you Googled um, Carner Blue, so Carner with a K and blue, you'll get a picture of it. There are a few other butterflies that look very similar. So this is one of the really cool things about iNaturalist. If you take a picture of a small blue butterfly that you see, 
the, uh, the iNaturalist community will be able to tell you whether or not you've found a Carn or Blue butterfly. So that's one of the things that I've been trying to do every summer is go out to the lupin fields and see if I can find a Carn or Blue. So yeah, the more eyes we have out, on, out in the field looking for them, the, you know, the better. And I apologize, we just have one more question. If you were planting two native trees, how far would you like plant them apart? That's a really good question. I would plant them at least 20 feet apart um, because even though they're small now, they're going to be big eventually. And you don't want them crossing branches too soon. Eventually when they get quite a bit older, you know, 50, 60 feet tall, it's okay that their branches cross and they form a canopy. But when they're young, they're going to need a little bit more sun. So give them at least 20. I apologize. We have a few, but I will let the other classes go first. Okay, uh, we can come back to you. Do you want to go ahead? What's the meaning of poaching? That's a good question. So poaching means the removal of a plant or an animal from its habitat, but it's done illegally. So it's done without permission. It's done without the involvement of a, a scientist or an expert, somebody that's involved in the conservation of that species. So often we use the word poaching when a plant or animal is very rare and we don't want people to take them from the landscape. So, oh, yeah. So like uh, when people um, kill like animals like buffaloes. Yes, often uh, rare animals are protected by law and you're not allowed to hunt them legally. And so people who hunt them are poaching. Do you want to go ahead? What is the app name? Okay, it's iNaturalist. Okay, iNaturalist. Yeah, I check it out. App. Oh, this thing comes up right when I, I, didn't, I didn't even spell it. It already comes up right in my recommended books. Great. Do you want to go ahead? I have two questions. My first question. Is how does it the, how does it test if it's alive or not alive? That's a really interesting question. And you know what? You are allowed to log dead things. <laughs> believe it or not. So it's important. God. A lot of birds, for example, get hit by cars or they run into windows. But it's really important that we log those birds too, because um, otherwise we might not see those birds and we might not know where they're dying so yeah you can you can log a dead bird i know it seems kind of gross and but my second question that sounds brutal. is this is for my mom because she likes gardening is the app mm -hmm. we yes yes it is do you want to go ahead you said you had a a number of questions do you want to uh, chime in sure just one second I've been trying to grow tomatoes for the past two years during summer, but they never grow. Do you think that you might have any advice on how I could get them to grow or why they're not growing? Okay, um, a question for you first. Are you planting them from seeds and do the seeds germinate or you plant the seedling and then it just doesn't grow very much? Um, we usually buy it at a store and let it like when it's in the pot kind of and just plant it in the soil after right okay so tomatoes need lots and lots of sun and they don't like too much water so i would recommend planting a tomato either in a really large pot and water it when it dries out or i've actually had really great success growing tomato plants inside of a compost heap so uh, it's full sun, they have a lot of room for their roots to go, and then you get endless amounts of tomatoes. So, good question. Full sun. They definitely need full sun. Okay, thanks. Do you want to, did you still have a question? Do you want to go ahead? 
I don't have a question. I just wanted to say I've seen a caterpillar on the ground when we were going on a walk. That's really cool. I forgot to mention that a lot of caterpillars will spend the winter on the ground under the leaves. So try to leave part of your garden not raked because all the caterpillars are hiding there. That's great it advice. Looked, it was like black. Does your class have a question? Yes, I have one of my students here with a question. Go ahead. Say it into the computer. Um, Louder. Go right up against it. Do bugs also pollinate weeds? Yes. So if a flower, like a really showy, colorful flower, then it's pollinated by an insect. So some weeds have, even though they're weeds, they still have big showy flowers, right? So think of a dandelion has a you know big yellow flower that smells nice. That's a weed, but it still does attract pollinators. Um, a lot of weeds are not pollinated by insects and they're pollinated by the wind. So ragweed is an example of a weed that is pollinated by the wind and not by insects. Do you have a question? Yes, we've seen like over a hundred different like little white caterpillars and they have little black spots on them. What kind of um, caterpillars are they? That's a good question and I don't know off the top of my head, um, but I Personally, I would put that onto my iNaturalist and within five minutes, I'm sure you will have a caterpillar expert chime in and let you know what you've got. OK, thank you. Does your class have another question? Sorry, yes, we do. For planting native plants, would you want to plant a lot of the same plants together or a whole bunch of different plants together? That is a fascinating question. That's a really good one. Um, so there's benefits to doing it both ways. So you will have to kind of weigh, weigh the options. So let me explain a bit. If you plant a lot of the same plant, you are more likely to get a lot of seed. Um, so the plants will get pollinated more and you will have a lot more babies. So if your goal is to um, create a lot of babies, have a lot of seed, and help that plant spread, I would plant lots of them, uh, all of the same one in one big patch together. Also, it helps visually. Like, So if you have a garden that you don't want to look too wild, you can plant a big patch of the same plant and you can have a really nice visual impact without it looking a little, let's say, messy. But on the other hand, if you plant all kinds of different plants, you're making sure that the pollinators have something to eat in every season because different plants bloom at different times of the year. So there's benefits to going both ways and I think it's it's really up for you to decide what you want to do with your garden. Do you have a question? Every summer, like I see like fuzzy caterpillars. Like I just wonder how like are they even fuzzy? Did you ask why are they fuzzy? Yeah, and like, are they like, like, are they like poisonous looking things? Right, yeah, so they are fuzzy to um, stop things from eating them. So primarily birds, but also um, it does discourage people from handling them. Some of those fuzzy caterpillars, if you handle them, you'll get kind of itchy. Um, it's not gonna, make you sick or send you to the hospital, but it, it will irritate your skin, kind of like a poison ivy. So I wouldn't touch them. I wouldn't touch any fuzzy caterpillar. I wouldn't touch any caterpillar, period. They don't really want to be touched. Um, but if it lands on you, let's say if it falls out of a tree, it's not going to hurt you. Uh, you just sort of flick it off and try not to rub the fuzz too much. Um, we do have to wrap things up, but we'll take one last question and then we'll wrap things up. OK, go ahead. Um, do you know what kind of caterpillars they have? Like 
I uh, think two orange stripes like on both sides and like a black stripe in the middle. Do you know what kind of caterpillars those are? And they're fuzzy. That sounds like a gypsy moth caterpillar, um, which we had a massive infestation of this year in particular. So if you saw lots of them this year, that sounds like it could be a gypsy moth. So you can you can Google that or you can, um, you know, use the iNaturalist app and uh, confirm your sightings. Great. I wanted to thank everybody for attending. Uh, and I wanted to let you all know that this lecture will be put up on the mcyu.ca website so you can review the lecture later and maybe do some assignments from it. And I do encourage everyone to sort of use the iNaturalist app, see what you can find. If you have any questions after you use that app, please send them to mcyu at mcmaster.ca and we will try to get Stefan to answer those questions in our What in the World segment. If you look at our website, you will see there's a What in the World segment where we have experts answering questions. So we can answer your questions in that segment if you send us the questions to deal with. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you, Stefan, for taking the time to talk to us about wildflowers and the biodiversity in our community. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.